know, what I want to know is, is how, how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. With all the insanity that had been going on in my life, I knew that it couldn't be just a streak of bad luck. I knew on some level that I had either created all of this madness on some unconscious level, but did my consciousness create this mess? Was there a part of me that drew all of this to me for some fucking lesson? You know, I'm so confused about the brain and the, the soul and consciousness. Like, did we live past lives? Is this some sort of karmic, you know, reaction to something from the past? I laid awake at night and I would just go over it and over it and over it and I would back up through all these years and I would backtrack on what fork in the road did I take that caused these things because my entire life once I got sober and once I stepped into that dimension of trusting instincts or trying to hear the truth and trying to do the next right thing. All I had inside of myself, my only resource was to put one foot in front of the other and to stay in the present moment and to do the next right thing. To clean up my side of the street. To do unto others as would want others to do unto me. And I kept it very, very simple. And I had worked very, very hard. And so with all of this turmoil and trauma and just madness, I was blaming myself on some level that I couldn't even understand. And I started really trying to pay attention to what makes us dream. What makes me dream and have these visions of this man's pond? You know, the minute I got his geyser in the floorboard of the truck, a couple of nights later I had a dream about his fucking pond. I saw myself walking into a swimming pool store and and finding these, you know, lifeguard styrofoam rings that they throw out in a pool if you're drowning. It has little ropes on it. It's like a donut. I saw myself buying those and turning those into these floating uh, mechanisms to hold his geyser. I had waterproof black paint that I painted these white styrofoam rings. I mean, I dreamed all of this about attaching the lights to it, the underwater lights, so that it would shine up and shine into this geyser. I saw the whole thing. And so when I woke up, 
I knew exactly what I was going to do to to help this man with these pawns. And so I followed that dream, that idea, and I went to a swimming pool store in South Asheville, and lo and behold, they had three rings, styrofoam rings, in that store. They were like $19 a piece or some shit, and I bought them. And I went and I found waterproof spray black paint so the things would be glaringly white. And I got some underwater lights and I bought some bungee cords and I figured out how to attach all of this stuff together to create this floating geyser for this man out at Sapphire Valley. But the question was, where does this stuff come from? Is all of this falling into place for some greater good? Does everything happen for a reason? Are we always exactly where we're supposed to be at this moment? Well, there's a part of me that was starting to think all that was just bullshit. Like, maybe my brain is just fucked up. Like, maybe the reason that I see a celebrity in people, like when I see somebody that reminds me of Ellen Barkin, all the way back to Regina, the first time I saw Regina in her ice cream truck, I thought of Ellen Barkin in Sea of Love, kind of a trashy sort of sexual being, seductive. Like, like does the brain just, you know communicate through memory does the brain communicate through association you know red devil was starting to look like a red clown like the red devil part now instead of andy mcdowell she was turning into this like creepy scary clown figure My life was in a real situation. And then I get a phone call from the Department of Revenue, this lady, Ann, who had come to see me. And she had been working on trying to find this, you know, headquarters in Bombay, this hotel group that had pretty much ripped me off. There are no victims, only volunteers, they always used to say in AA. Did I sign up to get ripped off? Did I make this happen? Did I create this? Well, she calls me and says, you know, we're, we've been working on this, but I have to tell you, we don't have the resources to keep this, this research going. I'm very sorry, but you're just going to have to pay this. Uh, just one thing after another after another. And my body, my nervous system had really shut down. I was very much, um, I don't even want to say angry. I was just at this place of neutral, just nothingness. So... I called up this man at Lake Toxaway and I told him my ideas about his ponds and I could come down and the only day I would be able to do it was July 4th. And he said that would be fine. And so I went down by myself. It was, you know, it's about an hour and 20 minute drive, I guess you'd say, from Black Mountain. So I had some time to kind of get it together in my head before I got there on how to handle the day because I wanted to get this done in one day. And so when I got there, it was probably about 10 o'clock. And I think, I'm pretty sure that 4th of July was on a Saturday that year. So the man comes down and, and says hello. And he says, I'll be back in a minute. I have to take my wife into town. The cashers, which they call cashers. He goes up, 
you know, he has to drive up and down this driveway so it was so long. So I get all my stuff out on the tailgate of my truck and I start to work on the very first pond. And I've got to go out in the water and, you know, I wore my swimsuit and a pair of shorts because I had to, I was going to have to be in the water most of the day. So he comes back down the driveway and they have this like minivan and he says, uh, I'm going to take my wife. They're having a 4th of July celebration and then I'll be back. And I said, oh, it's take your time, you know, do you need me? Do you need me? And no, 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 I don't need you. It's fine. And I really just didn't want him to be there because it's a lot easier for me to get focused when nobody's around. Well, the wife was looking at me with her judgmental look. Now I could be making that up, but I feel like I'm pretty intuitive. I kind of feel energy. It wasn't a real pleasant look when she looked at me. It made me feel real bad. And then I thought, maybe that's an attachment to my mother. Maybe I'm thinking that she reminds me of my mother. See, right now I'm in a place where everything's so confusing. I just don't know what to think anymore. Maybe she's the nicest person on the planet. I'm just making all this up. Maybe I'm making everything up. Maybe this is not even really happening. I was really on a tightrope. I was really starting to get a little bit scared of, of my mind. So they leave and I start working diligently on this first geyser to attach it to this lifeguard ring that I had painted. And so I'm working at it and working at it and working at it and it seemed like some time goes by and I get to the second one and he comes back. The man comes back and he parks his van and I'm like, oh Jesus, here he comes. And so I was using my tailgate kind of like a little work table and I had like all my stuff, my tools and things of that nature to work on these things. And he starts asking me questions about myself and I'm keeping it as vague as I can because I'm not really going to tell him about myself. Are you kidding? That's always such a juxtaposition when somebody asks you about your life. It's like, do you really want to know or do you want me to just tell you the little surface details? Because that's what most of us do. I think my life has been spent on protecting some sort of identity, uh, taking care of this thing inside of myself that wants to be okay. It's like a part of yourself that wants people to like you. Like I wanted to be accepted and I wanted people to like me. And I don't want anybody to know my flaws. And I don't want anybody to know the sick shit that goes on in my head. And I don't want anybody to know the real me. I don't know the real me. I didn't know the real me. So how the fuck can I tell you about the real me? I don't know. Well, I tell him, yeah, my dad worked for Kodak. I always throw that in there, which makes my dad sound like he was more important than he was. You know, I think if you mention a company name, like a dignified, good company, then it kind of, you know, to a rich person, then that would kind of make you a little more legitimate than if I said, you know, my dad was a janitor. And see, there's this, there's a whole set of, of things that we tell others and that we tell ourselves to make us be more legitimate and more important than we probably are. You know, I, I sometimes I thought maybe I'm just an imposter. I've read about imposter syndrome, you know. Maybe maybe I just don't even have enough worth, so I have to make up a bunch of shit about myself to make it look like I'm important and legitimate. So as I stood there and it was it was like I could hear myself talking, but I was outside of myself listening. 
And I start thinking about that type of consciousness. Like, you know, if you if you want to stop thinking, I mean, if it's me that's thinking, then stop thinking. And I can't stop thinking. And what is that part that keeps rolling? It just keeps going and going and going. So we stood there and he was really getting in my space. He was getting closer and he was, you know, it was like he was, his energy was kind of coming closer to me. And I felt myself kind of moving down the tailgate and I would get back in the water and he would stand there and ask me more questions. And, and then he went on to tell me uh, that I reminded him of a nanny that he had had when he was young. And he grew up uh, in Germany, I think, or some European town. And he said that her name was Helga, and she was a big blonde woman. And I thought, oh, of course her name's Helga. And then he said, can I ask you a question? And I went, oh, no. Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever watched wrestling on TV? And I said, wrestling? Yeah, have you ever watched wrestling on TV? I said, like, WWF? I don't even know if that's the real name of what it is. And he said, oh, no, no, no. Like, like real wrestling. And I said, what, like Roman Greco Olympic style wrestling? Well, not, not necessarily. Um, men and women wrestling. I said, men and women wrestling? No. I said, what do you mean, like porn? And I just said it. He goes, oh, no. <laughs> he laughed. No, 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 no. I mean literal men and women wrestling matches. And I said, no, I have not watched that on TV. And then I said, you mean like when Tanya Harding went to Japan and did something? No, oh, no, no. I think she was in boxing. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? Why are we having this conversation? And then the part of my mind, see, says, everything happens for a reason. This is all going the way it's supposed to. Just go with the flow, do your work, don't get attached to this, let these thoughts come and go. You know, so I've got this inner dialogue, this inner voice talking while this man is saying all these things. So then he goes on to tell me that him and his nanny, they had a little game that they would play. And he said that they would have these little wrestling matches and that whoever got pinned would have to take off an article of clothing. And I said, how old were you? And he says, I was around five years old. And I said, well, wouldn't you think that would be like child abuse? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, she, it was all in fun. Well, then he went on to tell me that he talked about his father a lot, and his father and mother had escaped Auschwitz, and they had made their way to Amsterdam, and that's where he was. And that his father had a little ice cream shop, and that this ice cream shop was becoming very successful and it was very busy, and his dad got the idea to put fruit in ice cream, because usually it's like vanilla chocolate. Well, he decided to pick strawberry and add strawberry, and then he decided to add banana, maybe peach. And he said this ice cream shop became like a gold mine. Well, one day in this ice cream shop, this American couple came in and they were sitting in the ice cream shop having their ice cream. And then this man approached his father and he told him that he had a string of motor ends across the United States. 
and that he felt like his ice cream could really fit well in this business model. And he said his name and the ice cream shop owner, this man who I'm working for with the geysers, daddy, takes this motor in owner up on his offer. And so they move from Amsterdam. Pretty sure he said it was Cincinnati, Ohio, somewhere in that region. And so he begins this ice cream business in this motor inn and it became nationwide and it was very popular and very famous. So then the man goes on to tell me that he'd learned a lot from his father about business and that he basically had built most of the medical units and hospitals in the whole southeast. He mentioned Miami. He mentioned some big cities and how that became his construction world of business was building medical buildings, basically. So he went on and on and on and sort of bragged about all of his accomplishments and what a wonderful businessman he was. And in the meantime, I got a fucking screwdriver in my hand trying to attach this goddamn bungee cord around this fucking uh, life-saving styrofoam ring to put a geyser. I mean, I am thinking I'm about to lose my mind here. And so time was going by, and I'm like, God. So finally, you know, I get down to the third pond, and it seems like I'm just losing track of time. And I finally just say to him, hey, um, do, you think, do you think you could make some coffee? Do y'all have any coffee? And he's like, well, I don't know. And I said, was there any way you can find out? Because I just needed to get rid of him. So he gets in his minivan and he drives up to the house. Maybe 20 minutes goes by and he yells down from the window of the house. I found coffee, but I can't find a coffee pot. And I just yell back up, keep looking like God. And so you know, he'd go, he'd told me during the time of all this talk that this was just one of the many homes that they had in the United States and they hadn't been there in over a year and they only came maybe once a year. Sometimes it had, they hadn't been there in three years. And in my mind, I'm thinking, God, I could just live here and, you know, when you come visit for the one week out of the year, I'll leave. I mean, how do people do that? How do they have all this excess and, and they think that's cool? I don't understand it. There's so much need and so much sadness in this world. And there's this huge like disconnect with the have and the have nots. Like he's down there telling me his big old story and he has no clue about why I'm even there doing that bullshit job for him. But all I knew was that I needed to get this finished and I needed to do it efficiently. And I was freezing because I'd been in the water and I was just kind of getting real tired. And so... He drives back down the driveway and he says, well, I've got the coffee brewing. Are you about to be done here? And I said, yeah, I'm getting pretty close. And he goes, well, okay, well, just come on up when you're ready and I've got coffee and I'll be able to pay you and blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay. So I finally get it all finished up and get everything cleaned up. And by now it's dusk. The sun's almost down, and I drive up the driveway. I grab my some dry clothes, and I brought my own towel because I just didn't know the situation. 
And I go to this sliding glass door, and he looks at me through the sliding glass door. He's very tall. He looks down at me in my eyes, and then he opens the sliding glass door, and he's, come on in. And I said, I just was, uh, is there a restroom where I can just change my clothes? Because I was dripping. I mean, I was pretty wet from being in that pond, and and he said, sure, sure, there's a bathroom down the hall. And so he, I, I come in and I look over to the right and I kid you not, there is a polar bear rug, a white polar bear rug with the polar bear head, like a real head. And there's a glass coffee table on this polar bear rug. And the polar bear rug was over white carpet. And there was a white leather kind of, kind of retro couch, a couple of white leather chairs. On the coffee table, there was two china cups of coffee two little napkins, two little baby sugar spoons, a container of creamer, a little cream pitcher, sugar cubes. Who the fuck has sugar cubes when you don't even live in the house? And I thought, oh my God, it's like a scene. It's like a setting and the lights were kind of dim. And I was like, oh Jesus, I've got to sit down and have coffee with me. I was just going to go up there and chug a cup of coffee and get the hell out, right? Well, I go in the bathroom, and I'm washing my hands and my face, and I'm just like, oh, my God. I'm just praying to whoever. I'm just saying, please, please help me get out of here. I don't, I don't have anything left in me to deal with this. And so... I change my clothes, I kind of towel dry my hair, and I come out, and I go, okay, well, I feel better now. And he goes, well, come over, come over, sit down, sit down. So I sit down on the white leather couch, and he sits down beside me, and there we are with our little china cups and saucers of coffee. And I said, well, thanks so much for making this coffee. I really appreciate it. And he takes a sip and he sits his coffee cup down and he kind of leans back on the couch and he's he's not looking at me. He's looking kind of up in the air and he goes, you know, Jill, I've been all over the world. I've done many, many things in my life. But there's one thing that I really, really, really want to have happen in my life before I die. Well, I'm sitting there sipping on my coffee, and I'm saying, oh. And I said, and what would that be? Well, I've done a lot of thinking about it today. You really brought up a lot of thoughts and a lot of memories for me. You know, you're a very strong, stout woman. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I guess I'm good stock. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And I'm going, (laughs) yeah, I'm pretty strong. Well, Jill, something that I would ask you to consider. If you would do this, this this would make my life complete. This is like one of those dreams I've always had. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what are you about to ask me? He said, Jill... If you would wrestle me, this would make all my dreams come true. And I just sat there and I put my coffee cup down. I turned to him and I said, you want me to wrestle you? And he says, yes. And he looks at me. I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, if I were to wrestle you, you would have to pay me. He laughs. laughs. Well, of course, I, I could do that. What are you thinking? A hundred dollars? I could, a hundred dollars? No. 
and I held my thumb up like higher. He goes, oh, 200, 300. I said, up uh, higher. Um, 500? Nope. How about 800? 800 dollars. So I said, yeah, 800 bucks. Because see, at this point in my life and in my heart and in my mind and in my gut and in my soul and in my cells and in my being, who cares? Who cares what else is going to fucking happen? I need money. I need money because I'm free falling in this universe. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how in the world I'm going to survive. All of my survival mechanisms are kicked in. My reptilian brain is just like waiting. It's just waiting. And so he says, 800 it is. And he kind of laughs. And the next thing I know, he stands up. He unbuttons his shirt, starts taking his shirt off, and he's got a fucking heart surgery scar all the way down his chest. And I said, wait a minute. I said, you ain't going to have a heart attack, are you? And I started laughing. He goes, oh, no, I'm fit as a fiddle. And I'm like, oh, God. We pick up the glass coffee table when we move it off of the polar bear rug. We get down on the polar bear rug, knee to knee. Now, my adrenaline is pulsating through me. And I'm saying to myself, Jill Haney, you have to pin him immediately and you have to get the fuck out of here. So... I said, well, what are the rules here? And he goes, well, the first person to be pinned loses. And I said, so that means uh, if I pin you, then you pay me 800 bucks, right? Exactly. And he said, and if I pin you, then I guess I could take 800 off of the invoice. And I said, you're not going to pin me. Because, see, I couldn't even allow that into my mind. I couldn't even allow that thought into my head. And so we stood there, knee to knee on our knees, facing each other. And I was looking up at him because he's bigger than me. And I said, okay, I guess on the count of three, huh? That sounds good. So I say, one, two, three. And he jumped on me and he bent me backwards pretty quickly because he he cheated. Well, I was in the process of going backwards. And as this was happening, I had to really, really dig deep inside of my rage and I thought, you are not going to pin me. And so I just started struggling and pushing. And I remembered that therapy session where all those women were holding me down on the ground, that limit structure. And I remembered how I had to push and how I had to just take everything from my entire psyche and physically bring it forth. And when I did, I got him back up to where we started. And then I started his dissension downward. And I started taking this motherfucker down. And I took him with all of my force down to the ground. I put my elbow in his Adam's apple. I took my right hand and I slammed the floor one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I said, you're pinned, motherfucker. And he looks up at me and he goes, double or nothing. I said, get up. And he was sweating and he was sort of giggling. And I said, get up. And I said, and do not cheat this time. Because 
I said, hell yeah, double or nothing. You're going to pay me double now. And we get back on our knees. We get back knee to knee, face to face. And I said, one, two, three. And he came at me again. Well, this time I didn't give him the time of day. I turned and I pushed him straight back down on his back, counted to 10. I won. I pinned him. He owed me $1,600 on top of the money from the job. And so he laid back and the sweat bead was like running down the side of his face. He was kind of glistening under this fucking can lighting that he had dimmed. And I laid on my side and I turned to him and I thought, this is the weirdest scene all that's missing is like a cigarette. You know what I mean? It was so weird. And so he laid there and he said, he had his hands, his fingers intertwined on his chest, kind of holding his, his stomach torso area. And he said, Jill, my wife hates me. And I just started laughing. I go, well, no wonder I said, does she know you wrestle? He goes, I have never, ever done this. I said, oh, bullshit. Because see, now I can say what I want. I can say whatever I want to say to this guy because of what just went down. And I said, let me ask you a question. And I said, be honest with me. Come on, man. I said, have you ever cheated on your wife? And he said, absolutely not. And I said, well, what, what do you consider this? This is recreation. Recreation. And I said, well, how many times in your married life have you been tempted to cheat? Oh, I've had many and countless encounters where I could have cheated. And see, I'm sitting there thinking, I bet you that, like, if he got a hooker, And she, like, performed things on him. He probably wouldn't see that as cheating. You know, because the mind is tricky. You know, denial is a very, very, very powerful drug. The drug of denial is probably the most powerful drug that we have. And so we had this conversation about, you know, infidelity and marriage and commitment. And I said, well, I said, God, you know, why don't you just get a divorce? Oh, I could never do that. She would take half of everything. And I go, oh, my God. And I started laughing. And I said, so you would rather stay in a loveless, horrible marriage than to just give your wife, pay her everything she deserves And then go have the rest of your life and be free and do whatever the fuck you want so you don't have to create these little fantasies. Well, Jill, when you get as old as I am, then you'll understand one day that you just can't blah, 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 blah. And then I started thinking how lucky I was to not be in that world To not be in that chasing the zeros, chasing the zeros of life, because it's never enough. There will never, ever be enough money or enough houses or enough gold or enough materials. And this man went on to tell me like what kind of you know, philanthropist he was and how much he'd given to charity and museums were built in his name in Miami and all these big deals. And I'm thinking, you know, you've done all these great accomplishments, but you're laying on the floor with a damn, you know, landscape, rock-working, alcoholic, lesbone nobody telling me how pitiful your life is. Well, all of a sudden, his flip phone cell phone started ringing. And we both jumped up. It was like this shock. 
and we're looking around, and he's like, and he sees his phone, and he grabs his phone, and he goes, hello, and it's Marilyn, his wife, and he, oh, yes, um, okay, you're ready for me to come get you? Okay, well, I'll be down there in a little while. I'm just wrapping things up with Jill, and everything looks real good with the pawns. I don't even think he looked at it. So he gets his checkbook, and he writes me a check for the job, and then he writes me the other check for the other job. And, you know, we have this, like, this goodbye. And I get in my truck, and I start driving away. And it was literally like the night I left therapy after that limit structure. My entire body was limp. I felt like jello. I, I, my muscles, everything was exhausted. And I started crying, weeping, driving down that road because I felt like I felt like I had sold myself. I felt like a prostitute. I felt like my moral compass was completely spinning. All the religious upbringing and all the guilt and all the shame about myself and who I was as a person and what I had become, all in the attempt to survive. It's our greatest reptilian instinct is to survive. And I was trying to make sense out of the survival. And did all of these things keep happening because there was some ultimate place I was heading? I could not figure it out. And there's so many different conversations that jump into my head. Don't try to figure it out. There's nothing to figure out. Just live life on life's terms. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. You know, all the cliches, all the slogans, all the self-help, all the therapy, all the spirituality, all of this jargon, none of it made any sense to me. And I started really looking at myself in the rearview mirror. Like, am I psychologically flawed? Is there something wrong with me? Am I a weirdo magnet? Am I attracting all of this craziness to me? Is my soul attracting all of this to me so that I can learn some huge lesson? Hadn't I had enough lessons? I knew I wasn't a victim. I really tried hard not to cry and complain about the circumstances. I really, really worked on using setbacks to pave the way for comebacks. I really saw the glass half full instead of half empty. I really believe that most things were opportunities to grow. But there was this whole other side that was just defeated and doubtful and scared and alone. And I didn't really have a clue anymore. And I questioned it the whole drive back to Black Mountain. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates.